So, yeah, since that's, that's what we're going to talk about now, in a sense, so he's, he, you know, he, the movement from passion to rationality is this movement from speaking to writing, right? Um, but there's this other movement that he's, that he's describing at the same time from natural cries, right, to conventional language. Um, and that he's linking up to this movement from um, these representational hieroglyphics to, these, to the more abstract kinds of <coughs> ideograms and letters that he's referring to later on in the, in the, in the more advanced stages of language that he sees. Um, but <coughs> one of the things that is, I think, curious about his, his schema is that, um, that a writing system that's actually based on ideas, which is more like the Egyptian and Chinese writing systems, rather than on sounds, you could, you could conceive of that as really more rational because um, it's closer to ideas rather than feelings. If you're focusing on the sounds themselves, then you're not really focusing on the ideas. You're focusing on kind of the, 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 the emotional part, you're the, the sound part, right? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you look at it that way, if, you, if, you know, if, he's, if he's linking ideas with the more advanced types of language, then it might be that you would have to, you know, you'd have to have like Egyptian and Chinese as more the, the advanced languages than, than the Phoenician and the Greek that are, that are so hung up with the sounds, right? Um, also, the other aspect that we might think about is how he assumes that the articulations within a word in an alphabetic language also lead to articulations between words in grammar. So you, you, you can think of articulation in two ways, right? Articulation can be um, within a word, right? So rather than kind of just having a scream, you have uh, a word with, with many syllables, right? Um, or you can think of, I guess you can compare a language that has fewer syllables in its words, you know, like Chinese, with a language that has lots of syllables in its, wor in its words, you know, like uh, German has lots of syllables often, right? Um, English has lots of syllables, right, um, in, in the individual words, and that would be a sort of increase in articulation within the word, right? But he's somehow linking that to an increase in articulation across the language between words, which is to say grammar, right, that, that, that increasing articulation uh, of syllables also links up to um, an increasing complexity in the grammar, right? But that's not clear why that should be. I mean, you could, you could certainly have that complex grammar w even with, with words that are individually not as articulated as, as other ones. And, and certainly, you know, different languages have different ways of solving this problem. Um, so, you know, um, you know his, his way of kind of setting up the, the hierarchy of languages doesn't always really make sense, but it, it is, it's kind of linked up to his underlying warrant, right? Um, in which he does see this, um, the only evidence for the movement of languages is looking at existing languages. So maybe that's, that might be a limitation in his method in a sense, that, that perhaps we, we can't really be looking at existing languages in order to talk about the origin of language. It might be that the origin of language um, was a kind of language, a first language that really wasn't like any languages that exist today. Right? That there, there might have been a kind of other form of language um, that we would have to imagine um, that would be the earlier stage of language, but in which all of the languages that exist that, that, that we know of, and certainly languages that have developed writing systems, are already kind of, you know, way beyond that initial stage. Right? Um, but th there, also, you know, there also does seem to be maybe a, draw a drawback um, in focusing on this movement from feeling to rationality and language. And Rousseau actually um, imagines this as well, because he, he actually talks about um, some of the problems of this movement from feeling to rationality. And this is the, the, this, the last section when he compares writing and speaking. And here he says, his claim here is that um, writing changes language making it exact rather than expressive. So, so this, this development of language is, you know, so the, the, you know, the movement from a kind of a primitive to a more advanced language is for him the movement of uh, language that is just spoken to a language that, has, uh, that, has, that, has include, that includes writing, right? Um, and so he says writing, which would seem to crystallize language, is precisely what alters it, right? Um, it changes not the words, but the spirit, substituting exactitude for expressiveness, right? So that's precisely the, the movement he's talking about. Feelings are expressed in speaking, ideas in writing, right? And so 
um, he, um, he sees that as, you know, the basic movement, right? Um, but he's also seeing this as a kind of disadvantage as well, right? So, um, you know, re writing requires a standard kind of use of words because a person isn't there to kind of like correct misunderstandings, yeah? And also, speaking allows you to accent certain words, emphasize certain words, in order to create uh, a better effect, right? And you can't do that with writing. And he, and he says that, that writing needs to think of other ways to do that that leads writing to be sort of more long-winded um, than spoken language, right? And so, and so in his evidence, he kind of points to this problem, or sort of describes this problem in the evidence, and he says, it is not possible for a language that is written to retain its vitality as long as one that is only spoken, right? So it, it, t it tends to be kind of becomes dull. Words, not sounds, are written. So uh, basically what he's saying is that when you write something, you, don't, you can't write the sounds, so you, you, you lose a lot of all the emphases and the accents, right? Uh, yet an inflected language, so an, a, a, a language that includes these emphases and accents, um, uh, in an inflected language, these are the sounds, the accents, and all sorts of modulations that are the main source of energy for language, that you can, you, you can, you can create these emphases um, and, yeah, you can, you can um, make your language more lively, more energetic, in a way you can't do uh, with the written word. Um, and that makes a given phrase otherwise quite or ordinary, uniquely uh, appropriate to a particular situation. Again, the, 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 the French here is, is is not adequate, but uh, I'm just I'm adding to a particular situation because that's really I think reflects better what the French says, um, um, which is to say that uh, a, w a written word um, has a kind of ordinary use, a conventional use that you, that you have to stick to, um, whereas when you when you speak a word, um, you can give it a kind of nuance, a kind of sort of through your intonation, through your emphasis, that really takes that sort of general meaning of the word and, and makes it specific to the particular situation you're in, right? And so you can't do that with writing um, except by kind of becoming more long-winded. You have, you have to describe things at, at more length in order to, to, to kind of approach that kind of nuance that you can get um, through, through your emphases in speaking. And so the means used to overcome this weakness tend to make written language rather elaborately prolix, sort of long-winded, and going um, from well, okay, so, so, so again, the, the, the French is very is weak, so I've just rewritten this sentence, right, from what you have in the book. It's not the same here as in the book, right? Um, so um, what's, 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 what's clear in the French is that the means used to overcome this weakness um, uh, will also enervate the spoken language. So, so the means refers both to what's going on here, it, the means are used to overcome this weakness, right, to make written language rather elaborately prolix, but they're also, in going from books to discourse, will even enervate the spoken language, which is to say the, 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 the types of strategies you use when you write things, those strategies start to affect the spoken language so that people start speaking the way they would be writing, and this leads to a kind of degradation of speech. Right, so, so, so the types of strategies you use for writing then kind of take over the, the, the spoken language and he sees that as a decline, right? So he does see, in fact, then, um, <coughs> you know, he, he's not really just plotting out a kind of progression in which, you know, we have to move away from feeling toward rationality. He sees a problem in that progression in that he, he wants to hold on to the passion and feeling of language. Um, and, he, and he sees that this sort of replacement of a kind of spoken form of language with written language and also spoken language that, that resembles written language, that's all um, a, a sort of a bad thing to the extent that it, um, it, it, bring, it moves language away from kind of energy and, and passion. Yeah?